Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hey everybody, welcome. It's Bree Noble and I am excited to be here with Tara Brisky. She has, I've been working with her for really years now. My goodness. Yes. Uh, probably about four years. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've, helped her uh, promote her course. I brought her on as an academy coach. Like I just really trust what she has to say about gigs and performing and the state of booking. And it's a really important topic right now because we're getting into that. We're moving into that post pandemic period where we're starting to see some events come back and we're starting to be able to actually book things now. And, you know, even if we've been doing gigs along the way in very different circumstances, right, maybe online, like she's actually been doing gigs this whole time. They've looked a little bit different, yeah. but it's been so, so um, inspiring, I think, to see that she's been able to continue doing a lot of gigs during this time. So I wanted to bring her on. I've had her on my podcast multiple times, but I wanted to talk about what it's going to look like now that we're moving into that period of post pandemic or just at least opening up and how things are going to change and how we're going to have to adapt to kind of the new way of doing gigs. So why don't you do like a, I don't know, 30 second roundup on yourself as a musician and how you ended up teaching booking. <laughs> Thanks, Bree. It's always good to be back on here. And yeah, I've I've been booking for those of you who know me, even if you don't, I've been booking since I was 15, which sounds crazy because I'm in my 50s now. But um, not afraid to own it. <laughs> but, good job. But ex- actually, with with booking, that's changed through the years. And the reason I, I partly started teaching it is just because I've been doing it for so long. And um, even as I was going to create something years four years ago, that was kind of the direction that. I decided to do. And as Bree said, she already kind of helped me in that promotion of it. It has been four years too. Man. So yeah, it's crazy. But um, yeah, so I, I've been wanting to help musicians and especially through this last year, as we've had to transition so much, um, that's still where we are. I still think booking gigs is huge because if you want to perform, you have to have gigs to do that. You do. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's where I'm at even today. And um, I know we're going to be talking more about it, but I I think that it's a it's a huge part of our music biz. It's not just kind of something out there. I I know it's probably one of the harder parts because it's it is a a difficult uh, thing to do because it requires the ability to contact people over and over and you can fear rejection. I mean, that can be part of it, but I'm telling you that there's some really great things even ahead. And even as I'm finding booking now and, and booking through the past year. So I'm, I'm excited about it and excited for those of you who are going to continue that journey or get back into it. Absolutely. Yeah. And for those of you that have kind of just entirely stopped, I know it's, I always say that booking is a muscle, (laughs) And if you get out of practice, it's going to feel super uncomfortable and a little bit painful probably at first, but, yes. you know, Tara is really good at, at helping with, you know, everything, especially mindset wise of being able to, to book. So let's actually start with how were you, and I know I had you on the podcast almost a year ago about how were you able to continue booking during this period? How did you change up what you were doing And how do you think that that is going to shift now that things are opening up a little bit? I love that question. Uh, It was when, when the pandemic first hit, or I should say when we went into lockdown really, because that's when gigs started getting canceled. Um, And, and let me just preface it with 
how many gigs I ended up having 45 gigs canceled. And I usually book about 150 in a year, but I hadn't even, I mean, we're talking to, you know, started getting canceled, canceled in March. And so these gigs I had booked, I had booked basically in the first two months of the year. And so having that many canceled also the idea of ones that I would have booked later on in the year, a lot of those did not happen either. But what what I had in my mind, literally when we started get, getting things canceled in March was, I know there's ways to do gigs online because I had done Facebook lives. I knew there was YouTube and um, I hadn't really done Instagram lives yet. But the, the point is I knew there was a way to pivot. I just wasn't sure of all the, the features of that. And so my first steps in actually just contacting people was saying, hey, for those that I had already booked, these were booked gigs that hadn't canceled yet. I said to them, you know, I just would ask them where they were at, how they were doing. And I would say, are you even open to the thought of a virtual gig? And here's the way that I could provide it for you. That was where I started. And I kept on that way. And and the biggest thing I want to say is that I kept contacting people throughout the time. Now that doesn't mean I called them every week. It might mean that I called them, you know, once a month, once every two months, but I would check in. And I think this building relationships was is such a key part. I've always thought that, but even more through the last year. And sometimes checking in would be like just if you're checking in with a friend and saying, how is it going? How are, you know, how are you, how's your business doing? How is this going for you? Are you having to adjust yourself? And can you even see music as part of what you're doing right now? So it was just really trying to keep a a relationship of sorts with people as we're walking through that. That was where I was going. And I would first offer that virtual to see if they were even able to do that. And And go ahead. I was just going to say, like, did the... First of all, I love that you said that because they're hurting too, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's hard for us, but this is messing with their business, whether they are a venue um, and they, they can't actually have any people or, you know, whether they're, I know you do a lot of like senior homes and stuff and, you know, they were dealing with lots of COVID issues, you know, and their people were like isolated, you know, they were dealing with a lot of issues. So I'm sure they appreciated you just checking in on them. Cause I know some of them you've developed long-term relationships with. I have. And so as I checked in and first of all, I'd, I'd offer the virtual and some of them didn't even realize that was an option. So that was wonderful to be able to, you know, tell them about it. And some of those gigs did then have me, they had me virtually. I created a link for them and they were able to watch it, but others weren't able to do that. They didn't have things set up where they could go live or have something broadcast to their residents, or if it was like senior places. And so it was, it was really learning how to say, okay, well, could we think of other ways? Now, when it was summer, I live in Minnesota, for those of you who don't know. So we are, we have four seasons and we definitely have winter. (laughs) So, um, and really the only time that's great for outdoor gigs is the summer. That's where we can be sure of nicer weather. And so as we got to summer, that is one thing that I was offering as an option of, could we do outdoor gigs? And, and I did a few, Uh, some actually brought their residents out when it was senior gigs and they spaced them out and I was far away from them and it worked. So there was that option. I just tried to get as creative as possible in uh, the process. And in some places, uh, even online, I could cross post to a page, for instance, like for the libraries, sometimes they wanted people to go live, but I could go live from my page and then cross post to their page. So it was it was a gig for them as well. And it, and it worked, but I'm just saying there was a lot of different ways of finding to be able to actually have concerts for people. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you got so creative is and and education that is so important, Mm -hmm. letting them know, like, yes, there is a way we can do this. If you want to, you know, if you really want this and some of them, they really wanted their people to have some entertainment. They just needed something, you know, so much isolation. They couldn't even see their families. So I'm glad that you, and I know sometimes you went through like a lot of trouble explaining to them, like, this is how you (laughs) could watch a YouTube live and, you know, so, you know, or this is how you could get on zoom and things like that. So, 
um, it does sometimes take education on our part in these strange times. So I'm curious, like, are there any kind of adaptive things that you used in these concerts like plexiglass or a singing singer's mask or things like that, that you see probably being useful going forward as we're not quite to the point where we have herd immunity and we can just open everything up? Yeah, I do. And the the areas that have happened so far or the ways I should say that I've done things and and it's not just me, but it's been the people I've been booking with, they've been creative too. One is plexiglass or either the, the place has purchased it. I have not purchased plexiglass myself, but some <laughs> Can you places- imagine I, carrying that around to a gig? What a pain. I know. <laughs> I know. I guess it's possible, but that's not my first choice. So, but it, but it is something that some of the places were willing to invest in. So that's one way. Uh, another thing, I thought this was one of the most creative. It was last summer where, no, I take that back. It was in September because our weather was just starting to get colder. I was supposed to do an outside gig, but this place couldn't have me come inside and it was too cold to actually do an outside. So they literally had me in their entryway. They opened a door so that people, I could put my speaker in the entryway and the people could kind of see me through the window. But the point is you talk about creative, it, it worked. And so that was another way. Uh, another thing was, yes, with the singer's mask, there's actually what they call singer's mask. There's type of mask that they're bigger and they have more protection in the material, but also more space. So you can breathe a little bit better, <laughs> not a lot, but a little bit. And I had some places now, even so, still that are having me come in as long as I'm wearing that and singing with that. And another option is that I've found is with people. Now this is particularly to senior places, but it could be event centers too, where I'm going to the actual place and singing into their camera, but they can broadcast from their system into people's rooms without having to go over the internet or having to do it from a link. So it's just another option. And I, I'm finding, and this is for all of you, that as you are booking, every creative option you can think of, you need to think of and present it to them as you're trying to, because you never know which one is going to stick and is going to work for them. Yeah. And I mean, one thing that I thought of that I ended up doing during, during this period, I think it was in May or June, I sang at a funeral and it was an mm. entirely online funeral, you know, and we just pre-recorded it. Oh, and yes. Well, I was there, but like we were all on Zoom, right? So we pre-recorded it and, you know, it worked out really, really well. We actually ended up doing a trio from three different people in three different places and we recorded over each other and it was really cool. Um, but I feel like even in going forward, like people realize that they can do a funeral online. They might actually start doing that because it's hard to get everybody to go to a place, you know, grandma lives in the East Coast and she dies. Right. And, you know, it's like nobody can come at that time and they're all living all over the, I mean, you could do like a local and virtual funeral. And so I feel like there might be openings for musicians to be able to perform at things like that, that might actually continue to be online. Yeah. And then I was wondering also, uh, cause I know you perform at churches sometimes mm -hmm. and I definitely have done that it, during this time where you know, the church is obviously going virtual to their people, but we went to the church mm -hmm. to perform yes. because there could be a certain number of people socially distanced. So did you get an experience with that? Do you see churches like doing that now? Are they setting up plexiglass and stuff? Yeah. Well, the big churches, the ones that have a lot of space, I actually did a senior gig at a church, a really big church here in the Metro um, where I was in a room, but it's a huge room. So they just had me way far apart from people and they had people around the room way spread out, but because it was big enough, they could do that. They had the sound system that worked for it. So yeah, I, I just think again, every option, but like you were saying with the, the funerals, even to be able to videotape, you know, record yourself on video, and then that could be played later at the funeral. That's amazing. I mean that, and you're right. Funerals, especially with people all over traveling can be hard. So I, I don't, I, I think some of these things are going to stay with us actually. And can I make one uh, other th thought too? Yeah. It's, it's, this is a, a, something I've noticed recently, and this is particular for those of you who are instrumentalists. 
because places are not all opening up to singers, if you are an instrumentalist or you are an instrumentalist as well as a vocalist like I am, where I play piano in addition to singing, I have found I've been hired now already for two piano gigs and I have two more coming up next month because they still can't have me singing, but they want music and they can have musicians. So if you are an instrumentalist, my point is this might be your time right now to get in there and to be, you know, to be sharing because you can, because it's not singing. You know, I think of like a harpist or a guitarist or, um, you know, whatever instrument you play, it just might be a really great time for you because of the singing. There's still a lot of places are holding off on. Yeah. Violin, cello. I'm just thinking of some of the people in our mm -hmm. academy, you know, we have a harpist yeah. and a violinist and a cello, a cellist and a fiddler, yes. you know, all those things. Um, and of course, lots of people that play the piano and the guitar. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like sometimes in the past, instrumentalists have been like relegated to background music and it's yes like, you're right it's your time to shine because yes you're you know maybe the only one that the kind of musician they can have in there yes and and what I found too is that I was thinking with playing piano because I did a gig just a week and a half ago on piano and I thought well maybe people won't be as engaged but I am telling you I think because people are so starved for live music they were so happy mm. and and I did play a lot of songs that they knew but what was cool is that I played the woman literally emailed me a week later. So it was the beginning of this week and she wants me again for next month. Wow. Same thing. So it's just, you, you don't know what's possible out there. And, and if for some reason you have instrumental skills, but maybe you're not exactly where you wish you were, this might be the time to pour into lessons and just up your game so that you have these opportunities. Cause I don't think that's going to go away either still think that's going to be a big part of the next, you know, six months to a year. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I know you had a, a bunch of things that you wanted to cover. So I want to let you go <laughs> on any that we haven't already touched on. Yeah. And I, one thing I, I want to encourage people about this, but also just to let them know that as people are booking what I'm finding differently from past years, you know, and I'm talking more like 2019 and before is that they are booking more cautiously. So it's not that they're not booking at all. Don't assume that. I, I find musicians oftentimes just assuming that, well, if nothing's opening up yet, I shouldn't call them yet. No, even if nothing's opening up yet does not mean that they're not planning. But I also know that when, as I've booked with people, it's not necessarily that they're saying, okay, we're going to book you for 10 gigs and you know it's going to be all the way through the end of this year. It might be right now. And I'm talking in March right now, but it might be that they're going to book me for April and May and June, and they might only look that far for now. But that the good part of it is if I'm on their list, if I'm contacting them now, I'm on their radar, and then I get a gig now, then I can get more gigs later. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Top of mind. It's important to be top of mind. And, you know, I know that you were one that would already be booked out like a bunch <laughs> of gigs for Christmas right now, you know, yes. and that's not happening because we have no idea. It's like what we've learned is that we have no idea what the state of the world is going to be like in nine right. months, you know? So like, don't be discouraged. People yes. are used to having your gigs booked out that far and it's not happening. It's not you. It's right. the uncertainty of everything. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I, it is funny. I do actually have two December gigs booked, wow. but, but that's, you know, normally by this time, I've got a whole lot of gigs booked for the summer already in fall. So yes, that's why I'm saying it is different, but don't be discouraged and don't give up. And if you only, if they book you for something, even, you know, two months down the road, don't think that that's going to be the only thing they'll book you for. It might be that you do that gig and then they're going to book you for quite a few more because they'll know more than two of where the state of the world is. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's just important to, to keep touching base. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, not be a pest, but like, Hey, just checking in, you know, wanted to see how, how things are shaping up for your calendar in September or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and again, again, to encourage you, this just happened to me this week where I called a lady and I left a message for her and she emailed back and said, Hey, I'm so glad you called because we are just opening up for gigs and I want to get you in next month. And so I am, I'm going to be singing there with a mask, but Hey, it's a gig. It's a gig. 
<laughs> yeah, that that's kind of a, I, I think the, the factors is, is just knowing that booking might be cautious, um, knowing that there are these other options of instruments, you know, as part of that whole thing of being versatile and, and new possibilities. And then all those things Brie and I were already talking about with the whole, um, you know, the ways singing with a mask, singing with plexiglass, singing outdoors, um, you know, singing virtually, broadcasting from a, a space. There, there's just, or uh, pre-recorded. Mm-hmm. All these are, are options for us. And I, I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon. I think, I think the more options we have, the better that we're going to be ready for people to book us. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I know I just talked to someone on clubhouse last night that did her first gig since this whole thing. And it was outside, it was on the street, but like, she's like, people were so excited. Like so many people (laughs) showed up that she wasn't, didn't even know we're going to show up because they just wanted to hear live music. So yeah, I, I think I would not wait. I would jump in and get going on your booking. Um, and yeah. I, I like, let's see, what else did we want to cover? Anything about, about online booking? Like how is that going to change now that I know we were like kind of overwhelmed by the amount of like Facebook lives and, and things <laughs> like that, that happened because that was all we had. Yes. What do you think is going to change about online stuff? I think that in some fashion, there may be less of it because as things open outside and you know, where people can actually come in person, of course, they're going to want that community feel that, that in-person feeling that you get, uh, even, even just for people attending concerts is what I'm thinking. However, there's still going to be people that a might not be as comfortable to go, you know, outdoors or to be meeting in concerts in person. Um, and I'm not even saying the artists, I'm talking about the fans themselves, mm-hmm. but I also think that live is still going to be happening. Uh, the places that I see it, well, it's, this is where it's, it is happening pretty heavily yet right now. I'm just going to name a couple of these, but it's uh, sessions live Twitch street jelly, you now, and then probably the ones we're more familiar with Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, zoom which right. we're on right now. And what I, what I do want to say though, about these uh, live shows that I've kind of found too, that maybe they won't be as often, but even as you go live, for instance, on Facebook or Instagram, it's about creating a memorable experience. So it's not just kind of getting on there and singing songs. And I think that too has been something we've had to maybe pivot as artists, because what happens is when, when you are coming into someone's home and they are seeing you on a screen, it's magnified. (laughs) Everything is magnified. So, you know, yes, your faces and your sound, but really it's more about how you are relating with that person. Does it feel personal to them? And so however you can do your online event where it feels personable that you're talking to them, you're asking them questions, you're engaging with them and asking them to really be a part of your experience. That I think is going to still be key for the online gigs that happen. If you just think that you're going to go online and just kind of play songs and expect people to watch, I don't think that's going to work well. (laughs) Yeah. I think you make a really good point because I think the way that we consume live streams has changed. I know for me, You know, once we started having to go to church online every week, we figured out how to hook up the laptop to the TV so we could watch it on the TV. So, you know, now, like you said, literally it's going to be magnified because if we're watching it on our TV, which is a 50 something screen, you know, size TV. Yeah. It's, we're not just watching it on our phone anymore. So you are, it all is almost like we're watching it on a stage or we're watching it on a screen. If we're at one of those concerts where they have screens, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so think about that. It's the way people are consuming online has changed. It's gotten a little more savvy in that way. And let's just like, well, if I'm going to watch an online show, I'm going to get my popcorn. I'm going to sit on my, you know, on my couch (laughs) in front of my TV and watch it and not just watch it on my phone in the corner. So that's one thing. Um, and I did want to mention too, about like, we've both talked about, um, release parties and how we think you should have live ones and online Mm -hmm. ones. And I think the online ones are going to get even bigger because people are used to the online consuming now. Yes. 
And like you, throughout this whole year, you, if you've been going online, you've been developing a fan base that's not local. Right. Like, so right. if you do a release, <laughs> you've got to give them a release party too, because they've been following you. They've been with you through this journey and they want to celebrate that you're coming out with music. So I think that was something that came up for me is like, I think the virtual release party is going to be even more of a bigger part of the strategy. Bree, that's such a good point because I was just talking to uh, a, a fellow musician who has done a lot of sessions live and she's created a fan base on there that is totally from all around the world. So exactly. It's that kind of thing where, yes, if you are releasing, you, you, you're going to have to do it online to be with those fans and not just, you're going to have to, it's, it's a, it's a way you get to. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Cause you've yeah. got a bigger fan base now online and, and then don't forget the local. Like I do think that that right. still can be done. I have a student in Australia where it wasn't as locked down there and she mm -hmm. was able to do a release show where she just split it up into two shows and had, you know, 50 person capacity or something at them. And it was still yeah. super fun, successful, and also profitable. Yes. Yeah. I, I think the more we, as you know, it's interesting because musicians by nature usually are known as creatives. <laughs> so I, I keep thinking this whole year, all I've been thinking is how can we be creative in this booking process and in the shows? Because we, we are having to change. We've been asked to change. We know that now, but with the change, change doesn't always have to be bad either. So I, I think since we have these opportunities uh, you know, we can find what works best for us. And, and I'm not telling you guys when I say even all these online things, don't pursue every one of them. It's overwhelming. But there might be like one online way that you choose that is going to work for you to continue to serve your fans and, and sing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just so excited that artists are going to be able to get back out there and start performing. And I hope all of you that are listening or watching are like ready to flip that mindset of it's not possible to book things yeah. into back into that mindset of this is what I do and it can be done. And I mean, just as like a, a final question, have you found like any, any mindset things going on with musicians during, during this time period that have been really difficult to kind of turn around. Cause I mean, you're still doing this stuff, right. But everybody out there is saying, Oh, it can't be done. And you're like, but I'm doing it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've just because of on and groups that I'm in, in, in Facebook, especially I've noticed a sense of that. Well, this is impossible or nobody's hiring or nobody's doing this. And I, I've, I've never found that to be true anyway. I do think sometimes it's harder to find places. Like you have to do more research. You may have to do a little bit more work to find gigs that are happening, but it's definitely not impossible. And I, I'm always, when, when someone is trying to be on the negative side, I understand it's been a hard year, but I, I've I've had the same thing. Like I told you guys how many gigs I lost last year. It was not easy. But it doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile to keep trying to find ways. And the more that you do, you're actually going to become more hopeful because here's what I find even right now. The, the gigs that I've been able to do in person are so much joy because I hadn't been able to do it for a while that it's motivating me now to go, oh, I want more of these. And you're going to find that too. If you even get one gig in person, it's going to motivate you to keep on doing this business that you love. Yeah. I think when we're isolated, we kind of forget why we loved it. Yes. You know, so <laughs> it's just taking that. It's just like when you don't like go outside for a week or you don't exercise for a week and then mm -hmm. You just kind of get like all, uh, I don't, I don't think I even really liked that anyway. Why did I think it was, you know, and then yeah. when you finally go back, it's like, oh my gosh, I missed this, but I didn't realize it. Yes. So I just want to encourage all of you guys get out there, get started, at least get one gig, even if it's for free on the corner, like just get out there and perform right. and it will get you into the, okay, I can start booking paid gigs again. You will be surprised how fun it is to hear clapping. <laughs> really, it is. 
it's it's a really great moment. So that's true. Yeah. Not just the uh, mic on and off thing, like on Clubhouse. Right. You know, it's just not as satisfying. No, <laughs> real clapping. You'll love it. Totally awesome. Thank you, Tara. This has been so inspiring. I really, really appreciate you sharing all this wisdom with us, like all of your experience over the past year, and how we can transition into this new time. It's so hopeful and I cannot wait to see what musicians are doing even just a few months from now. You're welcome. I'm excited too. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at profitablemusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.